Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everybody, depending what time you happen to be listening to this. For September the 24th, 2015, this is Thoughts, Comments, Opinions. Today on the show, we have on an old friend and who I know is a great guest, Louise Phillips, who is Ireland's top crime novel writer, talking about her new book, The Game Changer. We'll talk a little bit about what makes a great mystery story, great detectives of the past. We'll have a lot of fun. Also, if you listen until the end, we'll be giving away a copy of The Game Changer to one lucky listener. So sit back, relax, fire up a pontini, and listen to the words as they fly through the air. We'll be right back. On the line, we have Louise Phillips. Hi, Louise. How are you today? Hi, Hubert. Doing well. Thank you very much. Great to talk to you again. Fantastic. Okay, so the game changer. Um, Oh, actually, first question, because I was wondering this uh, uh, when I did the the, the intro. Should I call it a crime novel or a mystery novel? Oh, well, well, it is a crime novel, and there is a mystery. but I think the official title is a psychological crime novel. Okay. But that's, that's the official title. Now, uh, for, for anything like a uh, crime novel or mystery, I really, really don't want to give the, the plot away. So what would you like the, the listeners to know about the game changer? And I promise you I will not go outside of the, those uh, boundaries. Um, okay, well, I suppose it, as you spoke about there, it is a psychological crime story. Uh, so it plays tricks on the mind or, or I suppose digs deep into the mind and why people do certain things. In this regard, the characters in the, in the story. Um, Kate Pearson, who's a criminal psychologist, is the principal protagonist. And um, Within her, like she, she's been in each of the four books, although all the books are standalone books. But I think this time I dug deeper into her than possibly in earlier novels. And Kate arrives on the scene uh, in the present day, and there's a part of her childhood that has constantly bothered her. It's like the missing piece of the jigsaw. So uh, she goes to try and fill in that piece, and at, um, crime novels being what they are, there are other events that are taking place, like, for example, um, the potential suicide of an ex-teacher in Dublin and a vicious murder in New York. And so all of these kind of come together in this mix, and at the backdrop of this, there is the narrated voice, which is the game changer, and that's where the whole idea of my manipulation and cults and vulnerable people and everything just goes into the mix there and um, it makes for great fun. Fantastic, good. And you've given me a lot of latitude there and you've included the the, the, the uh, topics that, that, that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, Kate, um, your pr- pr- protagonist, um, the police site, police psych- psychologist where did she come from like when you you decided to write um, crime novels and obviously you know you you, you have you have to pick a protagonist how did you settle on, on uh, Kate and um, well I suppose it's like a lot of things in life it was a combination of certain factors coming together I was intrigued by criminal profiling by and large from a writer's human being perspective by way of understanding why people behave in a certain way and in this regard I suppose you'd be talking about in in a negative way and I felt that that sort of approach with other voices being linked in the various stories would give the reader a unique experience because they would see things from the criminal psychologist's point of view possibly from the uh, the victim point of view, the police 
I suppose, investigation point of view. So there was lots of strands were coming together in each of the stories. But as for Kate as a character herself outside of her profession, I think that um, I'm not, I suppose there's a lot of me in Kate because I, I tend to ask a lot of questions about the world, which is where Kate hangs out as well. And she's a mother, she, she, um, she's an independent thinker, and she's a little bit of a workaholic. Uh, so I probably have all of those um, strains, but she's probably a lot better person than I am in real life. But I think that's kind of where she came from, a little bit of me, curiosity as a writer, and just being interested in the area of um, criminal psychology, which is which is a strand of human psychology. And I think that's the, that, that was the main trust as to why Kate came into the stories. Fantastic. Um, in the Game Changer, um as you you mentioned that there's a part of, of Kate's past that that that, that um, she she's bothered about and repressed memory and mm. into it it's a controversial area um, how did you decide to put put that in well I I had used repressed memory in a previous novel called the doll's house and memory is a fascinating area and the whole way that we believe we recall events is is actually um, a little bit of a trick of our minds because every time we recall an event we actually compromise that memory which is why um that's my phone hold on a second let's take it off the hook oh, no worries. <laughs> we're a high we're a high tech show <laughs> and I'm wrestling with my, with my dog while we're talking too. So <laughs> sorry about that. Not so, a yeah. problem. So so do, so each of us uh, every time we recall a memory, um, we compromise it because we we kind of regurgitate it, which is why siblings in the same family would have completely different memories of childhood. So you have that whole idea that memory really is an unreliable source, and then copied into that is the whole idea of disassociation and possibly um, blocking out certain memories because the mind is one of the best survival mechanisms that we have. So if, if it perceives something to be very negative to us, very often, especially if it's connected to childhood, it will suppress that memory. So um, it, is, it is controversial, but the thing is memory is controversial and um, and, and that, that's just the way the mind works, it's, it's as simple as that. And with Kate, there were certain items, as we were talking about earlier, happened in her past. And I suppose for me, the, these sort of secrets of the past were hinted to in earlier novels. And a lot of readers had said to me, you know, when are we going to find out what actually happened to Kate? And this, this novel was the right time for that because it tied into the whole thing of mind games, sins of the father, uh, repressed memory, and how much we can actually depend on our memory recall if, if we're really put to test. The other big element of it, and one thing I love about crime novels or mystery novels is that um, it's almost subversive learning because you, you, you read the novel as as a great jigsaw puzzle, you know, and you try and outguess the, 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 the author in, in in sorting out out, out the, the ending, but you end up end up learning a lot about the world in the you know in that process. Um, the the notion of manipulating crowds of people, and you refer to the the Jonestown um, tragedy in there. What kind? kind of research did you have to put into for that end? Um, well, I already had a curiosity about both that and the Manson murders from, from a long time back. I, I think, you, you know, to live on this earth when you hear tragedies like that, I think as a human being you're instantly drawn to understand, again, back to the why. and. Um, before I started the Game Changer, one of the impetus for it was I was intrigued by how people uh, behave in groups and react in groups and how one person who may be perceived to be um, someone that understands their subject matter 
would be able to persuade somebody else of something. So that whole kind of group dynamic, which we all carry out in, like irrespective of whether you're in a cult or not, and arguably a lot of us are in a type of cult in the as if you live in the Western world, you're going to be influenced by Western thinking. And so that is actually the way kind of group behavior and how influences work. But in relation to the stories that you mentioned, I suppose I did, I did research a lot in, into both of them, both through kind of books and online. Um, and the more I studied each of those cases and other cases, the more the process be seen to be a very uh, logistical process as opposed to an emotional one. Like things, for example, in relation to influencing others, if somebody's uh, sleep pattern is upset, that can make them more susceptible. If they're vulnerable, uh, they, they're obviously, they, they need to fill in certain gaping holes emotionally. Also, if you're manipulative enough, and in, certainly in the case of Jonestown and the Manson murders, you're talking about an extreme narcissist at, at the head of each of those organizations who needs to feed into their own self-worth, but at the same time has the intellectual ability to maneuver people into their way of thinking. That little by little, whether it's through a dependency on the group, uh, an adoration of the leader, um, sleep deprivation, as I said, perhaps even the use of drugs, uh, various different confessional type methods where the individual starts to think of the group as more important than, for example, their family or close friends. So, um, so in all of these instances, there's a combination of very similar factors and processes used. And it's all really about taking away the individual identity and making the group identity and um, two to four. And once the group identity is two to four, then you actually have people at a point where they would do things that in normal circumstances they wouldn't have been prepared to do. So quite normal people join negative type groupings like this. And usually they start out, as in the case of Jonestown, for example, they start out with a very um, good moral base, you know, and um, civil rights, you know, fairness for individuals and things like that. And the more people invest in these organizations, if there is negative elements to it, they invest so much emotionally that at a certain point then to actually step back and to say, actually, the last six months hasn't been right. So, so to kind of put it, put it in a practical example, if you introduce a notion to somebody before they were if you like indoctrinated into a cult, they would probably say no. But six months in, if somebody has introduced something that they might find questionable, their mind nearly suppresses it because they've made such emotional investment themselves. It's very hard to do a U-turn. And that's also part of the strategy of cults. I hope I've explained that okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, um, I work in politics for there you go. As, as a, a, a speechwriter and reading the game changer, I, I, I kept making the equation of, wow, um, how our parties work isn't that much different than what the game changer is, is uh, 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 mm. doing, you know? But I think that that kind of feeds into, again, I don't kind of want to go on about the, the mechanics of the mind, but if, if you believe X, um, and you hear somebody else saying X is correct, you will, that will reinforce your belief of X. If somebody says, actually X is wrong, Y is correct, the first thing the mind does is try to shut out that Y. And, and the reason it does that is because it's quicker for the brain to process something that reinforces what they already believe than to actually question. Indeed, yes, you know, um, I forget who said this, first, but a uh, quote I love is that the definition of a genius is somebody who agrees with you absolutely. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, I think that helps in marital situations as well. Yeah. Now, you also lay it all right out. I, I don't know if you did this in the first two books, but in Last Kiss and The Game Changer, um, you put 
the villain, um, and I'll do it that way to not assign pronouns. You put the villain right out there. Uh, the villain quite literally writes down the technique being used and the manipulative aspects. Um, I love it. Yeah, I think it's, I haven't <clears throat> used that technique. Well, no, I have actually used that technique in each of the novels, some m more proportionately than others. And I, I think it kind of comes from my view that, you know, the world isn't made up of good guys or bad guys. Um, and there are extreme bad people in this world that we should all be very wary of. And I don't try and make my kind of, if you like, negative characters show them in, in a very positive light. Uh, but I think I... I don't really like novels whereby you're, okay, one is great to guess who the villain or the killer is, but it's it's like too easy uh, a cop-out. It's like, that's the bad guy, so let's try and work out who he or she is. Uh, for me, I think it's much better if the reader gets to hear the voice of that particular character, and then they can make up their own mind as to what level of... Um, I suppose, um, understanding they apply. And when I say understanding, I don't mean necessarily empathy, but that they're seeing the whole picture. Like there isn't somebody in a laneway with a shadowed face and a knife. They're seeing the face and they're seeing behind the face and they know what that person is thinking. And I think that makes the dynamic stronger and at times possibly scarier but not scarier, just the shock, but insofar as that, I, for me, it's part of the reader having a more fuller experience of the story. I quite agree, because um, it gives you your novels a great balance in that, um, and believe me, I am not dissing, Agatha, dissing Agatha Christie at mm. all, but you know, it was always Poirot or Miss Marple, and the murderer was one of several very secondary characters. Whereas yours, uh, you, your uh, um, Kate and whoever the murderer or manipulator happens to be, they get equal time, you know? Yeah, I think like it's, it's a different world now. And I think what, my, that, what might have succeeded and still succeeds very well within the storytelling um, process. I, I, I think now, I, possibly 50 years ago, the type of novels that I write um, would have been very hard for a reader. But I, I think the world has moved on and our understanding of the complications of humanity has moved on. So I suppose, I, I think it's, it's not so much that one is better than the other, but it makes sense to, for me to tell the story that way. And I think that people who enjoy psychological crime fiction really do want to dig deep. I mean, one of the reasons why a lot of readers are attracted to crime fiction is not that we necessarily uh, want to know about people dying or suffering or anything like that. I think it just comes from your human curiosity and our ability to, uh, I suppose, address the survival mechanism, but in relation to crime fiction, within the safety of your own home. So you're, you know, you can read about somebody at risk, and in some way, uh, in some way, I suppose, is a belief that you are experiencing it through the fictional world and there is a level of preparation possibly realistically you, you know it, you're never going to be prepared for that type of environment but i think the curiosity comes from our survival instincts and i think that's why people enjoy it for sure for sure now let's talk about 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 you when in life did you decide and i don't know if we choose to become writers or if it is thrust upon us but when did you, you know that you were going to be a, a writer um i think i don't think i i don't think i knew at an early age i was going to be a writer i was certainly a very avid reader and i think most writers were when they were younger 
um, as, a, as an adult now, looking back, and I don't think you necessarily have to have a difficult childhood to be a good writer, but when I look back, um, I, I think I recognised that as a child that like there were certain dynamics that were happening that in to some degree the fictional world was safer and more interesting than the real world. But what's really fascinating about that is that if you take somebody in that kind of environment where I suppose as a younger person they're, um, I suppose they're challenged in a certain way, although you're to some extent you're blocking out the real world, in another way you're, you're really hypersensitive to it. So you, you pick up nuances and you pick up the way people say things and how people, you know, physical gestures and tone of voice and you're, you're really hypersensitive. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is organically for me, I think that process was developing without me being aware that it was even a process. It was just my um, growing up time. So to get back to your question, I think when I was when I was in my late teens, I started to write quite a bit and I realized it was something that I really enjoyed. And then for a good number of years, uh, I stopped writing completely. And it, it wasn't that I turned around one day and said, I'm not going to write anymore. I, 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 I was busy with work. I got married. We had three children. The two of us were working full time because we had an enormous mortgage. And uh, my husband started his own business. So there was lots of things happening. And I suppose I, I, at the time, I, I just felt, and I think we, a lot of women are guilty of this, that, you know, there were other more important things for me to look after. And I think, you know, family is, is always at the forefront. Having said that, when I got into my um, 40s and our youngest child was 14, I went back then to, to, to look at writing again. I went to a creative writing class and the first night I went to that class, I realized that I'd let something very precious go. And that like that was, uh, gosh, that's nearly 10 years ago now. So I, and so I haven't looked back ever since. And it's just the most Im amazing thing to be able to write. Um, it's not so amazing sometimes when you're writing the first draft and you think it's, it's you want to rip every sheet of paper up, but <laughs> but by and large, it, I'm very lucky that I can express things through in the written word, and so far people seem to be enjoying it. Um, it it, it, it may sound an odd question, but um, I'll I'll explain what, what, why I, 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 I ask it. Um, and the question is, how do you know when a novel is, is, is uh, done? And I asked this of Steve Toltz last week about his novel, Quicksand, and he said that, when I can read the entire manuscript and not cringe. <laughs> so how do you know when a, a novel's done? I think I think he he's he's partially right. Although I don't know that any author can ever read an entire manuscript without cringing. And um, but, uh, but you will find that there's certain things that keep repeating, and you you're cringing at them every time, and you think, okay, isn't it time to change that? And um, the dynamic that I work in because it's it's genre fiction, and I've been writing a novel a year, is that. The, the realities of deadlines exist too, and in some way that's a double-edged sword. It, you know, it's great because I don't think I'd have fought four novels out there if I hadn't got a deadline. And in, in, to another extent, I think if 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 the deadline had been longer, maybe I would have kept working on the novels even more. So I, I know you asked that question of uh, Latchford a while ago about it in relation to a painting. And I think for me, I know it's done when I am at the position whereby I say, that's the best I can tell that story at this moment in time. It doesn't mean that I'm not going to write a better story in the future, but that I've written the story to the best of my ability. And I kind of use that from novel one stage because it means that when the book goes out there and Thankfully, more, you know, I've had mainly positive reviews, touch wood. But if somebody does have a fault with the book or is unhappy with it, you kind of go, 
Well, okay, uh, you know, I, I see that point, but as, but you also know you've, you've written the best story you can write at that moment in time. Of course, of course. Um, are, which detectives out there do, do you wish that you'd invented? Or to put it uh, another way, um, various writers, you know, have been assigned to write James Bond novels since Ian Fleming. And if there were problems of copyrights in estates and so on and so forth, are there any of the great detectives that you ever think that, you know, I'd like to write another Poirot novel or whomever? Mm. No, I think it's, I, I, I don't think you should really go there. I think you should recognize that they're really strong characters and interesting characters and fantastic characters to read. But I think it goes back to this whole thing of uh, knowing who you are as a writer. And in the early stages, <coughs> many an afternoon I thought to myself, I wish I could create a character like X or I could wish I could write prose like uh, another writer. But, but that isn't going to work. You, you, your voice is your voice. Um, now, I mean, there, there are, have been fantastic characters out there, and actually even outside of books, you know, the likes of um, Cracker was a drama series that was out in the UK, yeah. which was a male criminal psychologist, and he was really interesting. And Helen Mirren in, Mirren in Primal, I think it was Primal Fear, or no, Prime Suspect. Prime Suspect, yeah. That was... That was fantastic as well, and I suppose it's, it's not, I suppose it's surprising that I'm drawn to people who ha have used psychology or minds to solve crimes. So, yeah, so that's obviously my foray. Indeed, yes. Um, what's the best piece of writing advice that you were ever given or that, that you've uh, um, read? Mm, well, lots. But I, I actually think the best advice, it's a little bit like the, you know, Beaumont chair advice, it's, you know, to turn up. Um, because I that's what I kind of say to myself when I'm in the first draft stage, is that every day I will turn up for X number of hours. And if I, if I write one word, fine. If I write 2,000 words, fantastic. Uh, but to actually just turn up, because we can be quite... Um, we can be the biggest procrastinators going, uh, a lot of writers that I know, <laughs> and myself can world. be. And you know, you'll cut the grass and you'll empty the dishwasher and you'll kind of do whatever work needs to be done and you'll do all of those things because you're kind of putting off that writing element. And it's not actually, because I've put a lot of thought into this over the years, for me, it's not actually that you don't want to write, it's that you have a certain element of fear that the idea that you have in your head when it goes down on the page isn't going to fulfill your expectations. And usually it doesn't, but that's where editing and working with a story works. So I have a very simple formula, and, and, and I would say this to most writers, is to turn up. And to turn up in a place where you're, you're going to have space. And when I say space, I don't mean that you need to have wonderful views and lovely room or anything like that. You just need to know that you're in an environment where you can, um, I suppose, dig into the fictional world without feeling that somebody is going to pull you out at any second. Do you heavy duty chart out your, your plots uh, ahead of time? You know, like, I, I know that you're about to sit down and write your fifth, your fifth novel. How mm -hmm. um, plotted is it before you write the first words? Oh, it's not plotted at all. No, like I no, I don't. I I tend to I tend to start with in an idea, you know, with a uh, like theme. I suppose that's kind of the impetus for the story. Which, say, for example, in the Game Changer, was about group manipulation and in Kate's situation uh, memory loss and how that would play into, into the story that they were kind of going to be the, the two dynamics and from that then you, the characters come to be uh, I, I tend to start with a voice first I tend to not get into physical description too much I tend to 
try and find the character's voice. And then it becomes a little bit like if you have half a dozen people that you know very well and you put them in the same place and you lock the doors and you see what goes going to happen. And that's kind of the way the stories go. Um, so no, I don't plot at all, which is a tragedy in certain ways because you write yourself into numerous cul-de-sacs. But the interesting thing about cul-de-sacs is that you can create a very um, diverse and um, interesting story writing yourself out of those cul-de-sacs. So when I get to the when I get to the end of the first draft, uh, uh, um, and actually this is something that a, a fellow writer friend had said, and I think it's a very good thing. She said that she only actually knows what her stories are about when she gets to the end, and that's what it's like with me. So then I go back and I go, okay, let's grab this by the neck. This is actually what this story is about. What's going to work structure-wise, plot-wise? How much of that voice has to be pulled back or enlarge, how much more do I need to dig? And obviously then in the latter stages, you're working with an editor and which is always a great thing that somebody who comes to the work completely fresh when you've probably been regurgitating it for about four or five months. And then they see things that you may not see. And so that then it all takes another spin. And everything creates a spin. Like, for example, if I was doing research for a particular element of the story, I might discover something through that research that I go, oh, that's interesting. Um, I wonder how that would be useful to come into the story. And so that's kind of the way I do it. I, I wish I was a plotter. I know there are people out there who write really successfully, who plot the whole novel out from beginning to end. Um, and I wish I was that way, but I'm not. The only times that I actually plot out or do a roadmap, um, that well, I call it a roadmap, is coming towards probably possibly the final th third of the novel. And I I know X amount of things have happened up to that point, and I have a pretty good idea what needs to happen towards the end because you're seventy percent of the way through. Yeah. Uh, even though I have been surprised at times. So I would do a roadmap as to the type of things that I, I need to make sure I address or tie up because um, you, you really can't leave anything too ambiguous in a crime novel unless it's your intention to leave it ambiguous. Um, so that's when I do those roadmaps. But even, even at that point, like I've often got to like maybe three or four chapters from the end and, and before I start to write the chapter, I write it quite differently than I intended. Well, I will. I will tell you as a, a, a reader and and also a fan. Don't change. Don't okay. change. <laughs> Please don't. You know um, when I'm editing, and I'll I'll have writers say that, but I don't know what happens next, and you know, so they get stuck, and I tell them just listen to. Your characters, let them lead you, you know? Yeah, I think I think it's a little bit like life and what I, because I teach creative writing and what I usually say to people who, who are um, in the middle of the writing process is your first drafts are very fluid. Um, now that doesn't work for everybody, but recognize that whatever you put down the page you can change and um, hindsight is a great thing when you get to the end of your story and you know the end you can then go back and work on the beginning to to kind of heighten that sense of suspense and um, curiosity right exactly when you write the words the end that's like a loop that should take you back to chapter one <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, the end the that that particular end is actually the beginning because then you have a strong idea of the beast that you're dealing with i know stephen king in his book on writing and um, he, he isn't quoted as saying that when he finishes the first draft he puts it away for about six months in a drawer and then he pulls it out and reads it and, and at that point you go because subconsciously we're, we're applying elements to storytelling like that are fascinating and so in some ways when I look back on each of those four stories I think if if all of those words were destroyed and I went out to write each of those stories again I may not tell them in exactly the same way but more often than not, I'll be telling the same story. 
Fantastic. Louise, thank you ever so much for, for doing this and for the audience. Uh, the Game Changer is a fantastic novel. It, it has a ton of depth to it and fine, fine writing. Have a fantastic day, Louise. You Good too, you. To you. And thank you so much. My okay, pleasure. take care. Once again, I'd like to thank Louise Phillips for having been our guest today of Thoughts, Comments, Opinions. Now then, I promised you that we have a giveaway. I have a copy of The Game Changer to send to one lucky listener, or if you'd like to send it to a friend, I can send that out too. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to share this podcast, whether it's on San Diego Book Review or the YouTube channel um, or our Patreon page, which is www.patreon.com slash thoughts, comments, opinions. If you share the podcast, then send me an email. I will take your word for it that you're an honest person to H-L-O-H-E-A-R-N. H-L-O-H-E-R-N at gmail.com and just put in the header, share. And on October the 15th, out of all those, somehow by random selection, I'll pick a number, who the heck knows how, but uh, one lucky listener will get a copy of the Game Changer heading out to you. So that's it for now. So from all of us here in Ireland who work the late, late shift, good night, everybody, and be seeing you.